good evening, all out there in internet land. We again come to our Thursday night Bible study here at the Road Angel Trucker Center at exit 68 on I-70 here in Illinois, right next to the little town of Brownstown. Uh, this evening, we're finishing up Deuteronomy and moving into the book of Joshua. We will be leaving off Moses as he has ended his ministering to the people of Israel and his successor Joshua will take up the mantle leading them into the promised land to complete that great promise to to bring them into their final rest that's in the land they've been brought to but Moses cannot enter or he'll be dying on this side of the room to allow Joshua to bring the rest of the way here in chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, the last chapter of the last book of the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. I'd like to start by praying this in this evening and asking the Lord his blessing on our gathering. Lord God, thank you for bringing us here again together. Thank you for keeping us safe when we parted and now that we have met again to delve into your living word. And thank you, Lord, for this word you set before us to show us your wisdom and your will. Lord, we ask you to kindle that spirit in our hearts that leads us into all wisdom, that spirit that gives us a hunger for your word, that gives us understanding. And Lord, mostly we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, your substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. Open the way for our salvation through faith in him. And in Jesus' name I pray. And amen. Now this evening, we'll hit the end of the Pentateuch, chapter 34. We'll give a little introduction to the historical books, which we're about to delve into. To hit the beginning of uh, Joshua a little bit. I'm not as prepared this evening as I could be. We're starting a little bit late. But... Uh, We'll get through this part, and we'll get through more next time. So we should do all right. But here, in chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, we have uh, the death of Moses uh, right after the close of his ministry to the people. And we'll start out with uh, verses 1 to 4, read these and discuss them starting out in chapter 34 of the book of Deuteronomy. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab into the mountain of Nabal to the top of Pisgah, that is, over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zor. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abram, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Now, Moses here climbs upward towards heaven as high as the top of Pisgah. That is the highest point there in those promontories. Uh, there to die at the place appointed. Back in chapter 32, the Lord had foretold he would not be going over in the promised land. And there, 
He went up to the mountain of Nebo, the highest point. There in verse 1. Uh, a sign that his health was good, his natural force had not abated, went up by himself without help. And he went up there to show, first of all, he was willing, willing to die. He doesn't need to be afraid to leave this life. He knows where he's going. And it shows that he looks upon death as ascension. As in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21, where we read, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? So he was expecting. And this uh, climb symbolically shows his ascension to the heavenlies upon his death. When God's servants are sent out of the world, uh, the summons asks, go up and die, as in this case. Now Moses looks down again toward the earth, being promised the site of the promised land. He sees Canaan, into which he will not enter. But uh, by faith, he and we are all looking toward the heavenly Canaan. That, uh, that paradise, that new world, made at the end of times, but which Canaan is a form and a shadow. Moses is now to immediately enter that reward, though he won't have the chance in this earthly form to follow the people he had so cared for into their reward here in this world. Now, he did promise, as I said, that he would have a chance to see where they were going. He'd be shown the promises performed here. Uh, in verse 1, it says, The Lord showed him all that good land. He went up alone to the top of that mountain after the flesh, but not really alone. The Father was with him. As John says in uh, verse 16, in chapter 16, verse 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, now is come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. We don't need to fear any evil, as the prayer says. The Good Shepherd is with us, as in Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, his sight was very good up there at the top of that great promontory. He had the advantage of the high ground. Uh, he couldn't have seen what he now saw. All of Canaan from one end to the other, about 50 or 60 miles. But the Lord, it says, showed it to him. He that gives the spirit of wisdom, as well as the spirit of revelation, showed it to him as promised, that he would see where his people would go. He saw it at a distance. Moses being the deliverer of the law, the uh, seminal leader of the people of Israel, who would be God's light to the world. The Old Testament saints had such a sight of the Messiah at a distance. They saw it afar off, looking ahead for him. Abraham, along before this, saw Christ's day. 
was fully persuaded of it and embraced that promise. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 13, we read, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims of the earth. Now, that's the sight believers now have through grace of the glory of the future state when Christ will come again and the world will be remained. Then they had a sight afar off of the coming of the Lord who has come. Uh, the word and the ordinances to those of Israel or like Mount Pisgah was to Moses. That which they stood upon in faith to see afar off that promised land. Now, he saw it, but he's not going to go there. He will not enjoy it. Uh, glorious things are to come about in the kingdom of Christ in the latter days. But not all of us will see that flourishing state of Christianity. We foresee it. We're not likely to live to see it. Most generations of Christians haven't. He saw all of this just before his death. Many times, God reserves some of the greatest, the, the brightest discoveries of his grace to his people to support their dying moments, to comfort us as we come to him and have to leave all that we know here. Likewise, it was here with Moses. And likewise, we see afar off our next encounter with Jesus as the Old Testament saints saw his coming in their day. That brings us up the verses 5 to 8 in this small chapter here and the death of Moses beginning in verse 5. So Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord and he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor but no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old. When he died, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab. Thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And his death is burial, and the uh, mourning for him, of his people. Now first, we see that he is called the servant of the Lord. Not just as a good man, all saints are God's servants, but as a useful man, very useful. Uh, he served uh, God's counsel bringing Israel out of Egypt, climbing the mount to encounter God when others were afraid, and bringing the law to them. Yet here we see that he dies. Uh, his uh, holiness, his usefulness, his obedience would not uh, exempt him from death. He died there that he might rest from his labors, which had been great in the wilderness with his own people against him part of the time. And likewise, the saints die to receive the reward and to make room for others, as Joshua will come up after him. Yeah. 
and those in heaven, we know, serve him day and night in his temple, serving him better even than they do on earth. Now, likewise, he dies according to the word of the Lord. At the mouth of the Lord, it says. Uh, he died in compliance with the will of God. In Acts 21 and verse 13, we see that then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and break mine heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes. Paul, like Moses, most, was uh, ready for his appointed time, should it come. Now, verse 6, we get to his burial. God himself burying him uh, by the ministry of angels. The funeral, though very private, uh, would be very magnificent thereby. When Moses was dead, God buried him. When Christ was dead, God raised him. The law of Moses was going to have an end. It would serve its purpose. It would bring us into the promise. But then the sacrifice of Jesus and his work upon the cross would have no end. And Jesus would reign forever upon the seat of David and is now at the right hand of the Father. The gospel of Christ brought up out of that tomb will last eternally and be our eternal promise. In Romans chapter 7, verse 4, we read, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, it tells us he was buried in the valley over against Beth Peor, the particular place not being known. Uh, Israel, that nation, devoted to God and sometimes obedient, still had a great tendency towards idolatry. And it might be thought quite expedient that they had no place particular that they knew his body was where they might have thrown up a shrine and been idolatrous there. And in verse 7 then, after the burial, we come to some particulars. His age, in particular. His life was long, 120 years old. The first 40, he lived in Pharaoh's court. And then he was at ease and honored there among the great people of Egypt. And then the second 40, having run away from that, he was a shepherd in Midian. A poor and common man. Then being called back by God, the last forty, including bringing Israel across the wilderness, he was the king in Jeshurun. He was in honor and in power, leading God's people, lately formed into a nation. To their promise. And then he comes to a good old age, it says. His eye was not dim, his natural force not abated. He lived until he died and then left this earth into the embrace of the Lord well pleased with him. Now, left behind was Israel though they would have a new leader, and that leader had been endorsed by Moses and by the Lord. Or here in verse 6, it tells us how they mourned. 
for the leader they had often argued with and complained against, but that they appreciated now that he was gone. And the mourners, these children of Israel, fickle though they were, did mourn for him at the end. And they mourned 30 days. Now, they weren't perpetually grieving, nor should we be, however bare loss is. But uh, we do have to suffer the wound at least long enough for it to heal through time. And that brings us to the last part of the last chapter of the last book of the five books of Moses, uh, verses 9 through 12, where after Moses, Joshua enters. And verse 9 we begin, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants and all his land, and in all that mighty hand and in all that great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. So here Joshua is praised, praised greatly uh, as an admiral man qualified for the work that he's called to here in verse 9. Now Moses brought Israel to the borders of Canaan and then died and left them. Uh, the law makes nothing perfect. As in Hebrews 7, verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect, but the beginning in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. It brings men into the wilderness, as the Israelites were, the wilderness of conviction, showing us our sin. Uh, but the law doesn't bring us into Canaan the rest of settled peace with God. And so Moses did not go into Canaan either. Joshua, our Lord Jesus, of whom Joshua is a type, do that to us. Bring us through our conviction and repentance, through faith in him, to the grace of God and his forgiveness and our peace and our reconciliation to our Lord. Romans chapter 8 and verse 3 reads, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now, three things uh, make Joshua's call to this great undertaking he's to do clear and plain for him. One is that, speaking of Joshua, God made him fit for it. He was full of the spirit of wisdom. As a prophet, as Moses was, the Lord spoke to him. The Lord put wisdom in his heart. The Lord made vital his understanding of the Lord's will. Now Moses, likewise, uh, by divine appointment from God, had ordained him to it. Moses had laid his hands upon him, so substituting him to be the successor for Moses. Yes. So the Lord and Moses had both set him to the task, 
And then there are the people, the people of Israel, who cheerfully accepted him and submitted to him, it says. Moses is praised in verse 10 and 12. Yeah. Uh, the good reason. He was a very great man, used to God as no other prophet since had been at the end of this book, especially on two accounts here. His intimacy with God, it says, God knew him face to face. When speaking that no other prophet had arisen like Moses, that's the first thing they mentioned. He went up on that mountain to speak face to face with the Lord and in the witness of all the people, not uh, to have a vision or a dream that he would then have to report the people, but they're in front of them, but them as witnesses to speak to the Lord in intimacy. And so he knew God. Look at Numbers 12. Verse 8. Uh, and his interest and power in the kingdom of the Lord. He announced the miraculous judgments on Egypt before Pharaoh and the miracles of mercy upon Israel in the wilderness and in bringing them out from Egypt unscathed. He was used to the Lord for the great signs that showed Israel their Lord had come to them to fulfill those promises made so long ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. Greater than any of the other prophets of the Old Testament. God gave the law by Moses. He formed the Jewish people and the Jewish religion. Other prophets would send uh, direction and would uh, uh, give criticism and give predictions. They would do a lot of flashy stuff too, raising dead and parting waters. Uh, and Malachi 4 Verse 4, though we read, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgment. This is the last of the prophets, and he concludes with this order to remember the law of Moses. That law given to create his people who would be the light to the world, to prepare us for his son. The other prophets come short of it. And as far as the other prophets come short of Moses, certainly our Lord Jesus went far beyond it. Uh, Jesus had been with the Lord for all eternity, co-eternal, and not created being. God does now, in these last days, speak to us through him. Moses was faithful as a servant. Christ as a son to the Lord. And the history of Moses leaves him buried in the plains of Moab. As I said before, he went into the grave. And he concludes with the period of his government came to an end. The history of our Savior leaves him sitting at the right hand of the Almighty. And we're assured that the increase of his government and peace there, there shall be no end. So the Apostle, in his epistle to the Hebrews, uh, largely sets about proving the preeminence of Christ above Moses and the good reasons why there are the Christians should be obedient and faithful 
and constant in our faith to our Lord. And uh, our reading in Hebrews after this uh, would probably be uh, beneficial as we come right off the end of Moses' story. Okay? And into the beginning of the historical books. Good time. Okay. Now, as we come out of the Pentateuch and into the historical books, although there's history uh, all through the Pentateuch as well, we begin with Joshua and they go on till Esther inclusively, about 12 books there. Uh, now, the history of Israel has seven periods. Here. you got the call of Abraham up to the Exodus when they begin to go toward the Promised Land. Uh, the book of Job is in that period. Yeah. Then from the Exodus to the death of Joshua, which as we know, uh, we have the death of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy, then going to the death of Joshua, the next leader. That period is uh, uh, gathered from the books of Exodus where Joshua uh, first comes to us, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and some of Leviticus. Uh, that is the period of the judges. The death of Joshua up until when Saul is called, when a king is called in Israel. Uh, then you have the period of the kings. From Saul to the captivities. In uh, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. And then the captivities, when they are captive. Uh, Esther, historical parts of Daniel. You know, first, second to last, when they restore the Commonwealth but under Gentile overlordship. Uh, the end of the 70 years captivity, it starts at, to the return of the Jewish remnant, the destruction of Jerusalem in about AD 70. Now, the inspired history of that time, the prophetic writings in, in, in Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and uh, there's then historical and biographical material in the New Testament. And then the seventh period of the history of Israel would be the present dispersion, which we'd start reading about in Luke. According to the Old Testament prophets, this will end by the final regathering promised by the covenant in Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 to 9. They would end that the Messiah might come and fulfill the prophecies. In the year AD 70, Jerusalem is again destroyed and begins our current period. Here, in the book of Joshua, we will see that period from the Exodus, beginning in this second period of Israel's history after its formation in the wilderness, as uh, we all in our journey are formed while in the wilderness, that wild place of sin and desolation, where we come under conviction, being found by the Lord, and are brought out. And so here they are finally brought out and across the river. 
and prepare for this first book of Joshua that uh, begins this history. There are a couple of parts. There are a couple parts that Joshua's coming into the Promised Land. There's the out of, out of the, uh, and, and the into, into the Promised Land. Uh, there's this phrase. Let me look. Verse two in Joshua's chapter one: "The Moses, my servant, is dead." Now the law, which Moses represents, can't give a sinful people victory. Joshua, a, a type and figure of Jesus, will be bringing them into that promised land. Uh, this uh, book of Joshua is kind of like the, uh, in a spiritual sense, the Ephesians of the Old Testament. It talks about uh, 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 the heavenly of Ephesians is to the Christian what Canaan here is to the Israelite. Uh, it's a place, a place uh, of conflict to uh, the Israelites, and therefore not a type of heaven, but also it's a place of victory, uh, a place of blessing through divine power, or that place where we come to when we've matured enough that the Lord can bless us, bring us out of sin, and into that hard conflict and work of putting down the old man and embracing the new in our lives. Now, let's see. In this book, Joshua succeeds Moses as the, uh, the governor of the uh, Israel people, ruling under God, the theocrat, and there'll be four parts of this book. The conquest up to verse 12, partitioning the rest of the lands into the inheritances in 13 to 21. The beginnings of discord in Israel when you get to verse 22. And then Joshua's last councils and, and his death in 23 and 24. These events are going to cover a period of 26 years and will show through Joshua a type of Christ who leads us into righteousness. And we will begin on these historical books in our next session uh, Thursday evening at 7.30 here at the Road Angel at exit 68 when I-70 Illinois, the next time we meet. Uh, but for now, I'd like to pray us out and ask the Lord's blessing upon our going out as he blessed our coming in. The Lord God, I would ask that you be with us this evening as we all go on our way. I would ask that you be with all those on the highways and byways, that you send your angels before them to spring every trap of the enemy, that you protect them from every danger, physical and spiritual, of the road. I ask that you kindle that spirit in our hearts that gives us a hunger for your word, that we will stay in your word every day, not just in these meetings. That we'll remember your word and thirst for it. And that you might lead us into wisdom. And I thank you, Lord, for those you brought here together. That we might, in faith, support one another. 
And I thank you, Lord, uh, for the honor of speaking your word here. And I ask that you bring us again safe together, all those that you might bring. And not only uh, on our YouTube channel and Facebook, but here to our door in person, where we might serve them in the name of your Son. And in Jesus' name, it is I pray, O Lord, and amen. And that's the end of our Bible study for this Thursday. And for your attendance, and uh, I'm honored to have had a chance to uh, be of some benefit if I have. And good night. Sir.